Norwich, a City of Industries by Nick Williams, 2013. Lawrence, Scott and Electromotors. William Harding Scott was an extraordinary man. He built a business in Norwich that was quite unlike anything that had gone before it, one that became preeminent in its field and one that continues to be successful today as ATB Lawrence Scott. His genius lay in recognising the potential of electricity as a source of motive power in industry. Scott was an inventor, but also a perfectionist, whose determination to solve the problems he encountered was legendary. The scope of his activities was impressive, and his ability to find practical solutions to technical problems gave Lawrence Scott an international reputation. After his initial work on dynamos, Scott turned his hand to the generation and supply of electricity, building electric motors, making control gear and switch gear, steering gear, winches for marine use and cutting and tunnelling equipment. Just before his death in 1938, the company had developed some of the earliest traffic lights in the UK, which were installed in Norwich. At his death, Scott had built a company which had a worldwide reputation for his electric motors, winches and control gear. Furthermore, he had established it in an area with no tradition of heavy industry, far from the factories and shipyards it supplied. It appears Scott first came to Norwich in 1883, when his employer, the Hammond Electric Light and Power Company, were installing electric lighting to illuminate the roadways and printing works at Coleman's Carrow Works. Supervised by Edward Paris, Hammond's electrician, it used a 12 horsepower Reuters and Watt steam engine to drive a dynamo, which in turn provided enough power to light 50 small lamps strung on wires. It was claimed that each lamp would last for about 1,000 hours before the carbon coil had to be replaced. The firm's proprietor, Robert Hammond, took the opportunity to extol the benefits of electric lighting by giving a lecture at the Agricultural Hall in April 1883. The hall was lit by the new lighting, and the press reported that it produced a pure and remarkably steady blaze of light, illuminating the stage with a radiancy that made no addition at lighting in the area of the room necessary. Once the work at Carrow was completed, Paris and Scott remained in Norwich, setting themselves up a business as Paris and Scott at a workshop in King Street that they rented from Coleman. Edward Paris was a German who lived in Norwich for at least eight years and later worked for the Brush Electrical Company. The workshop near Dragons Hall was later known as the Gothic Works due to its castle-like appearance. Coleman also helped Scott personally by renting him a cottage in Brackendale. By the 1880s, the possibilities of electricity were evident, initially as a source of lighting to replace the smelly and dangerous gas lighting, but also as a source of power in workshops and factories. Paris and Scott hoped to take advantage of the opportunities this provided, but lacked capital. This arrived in the shape of Reginald Lawrence, the wealthy son of a stockbroker who was looking for somewhere to invest. He put £6,000 into the business, becoming a dominant partner, the firm being renamed Lawrence Parents and Scott. Jeremiah Coleman also took an interest, buying £3,001 shares, leaving Paris and Scott with £1,000 each. Although Lawrence had trained as an engineer with Cockwills in Liege, his contribution to the business was that of providing stability and discipline, and perhaps reining in Scott's determined pursuit of perfection. At the time, the King Street premises held a workshop with four lathes and other equipment as a small drawing office where the firm's two draftsmen worked. Edward Paris resigned in 1889 and moved back to London. The firm was renamed Lawrence and Scott. The new business was soon offered an opportunity to demonstrate its expertise. In 1889, they installed electric lighting powered by a small generating station in the lending and reading rooms of the Free Library in St Andrews to demonstrate its effectiveness. It caused a sensation, but more importantly, brought in orders for electric lighting. Paris and Scott built a central generating system which supplied electricity via overhead cables. Initially, the supply was unmetered, with customers being charged a flat rate each quarter. Lacking the capital required to invest in a large-scale electrification project, a Lawrence Scott was unable to meet an increasing local demand for electric lighting, and in 1891 the Norwich Electricity Company was formed to supply the city. Scott designed the generating station and the distribution system which consisted of bare copper mains supported by earthenware insulators within iron pipes. By 1896, seven miles of new mains had been laid throughout the city and the efficiency and reliability of Scott's system enabled the new business to make money. 
Freed from the distractions of running an electrical distribution business, Lawrence Scott concentrated on making and selling electric motors and dynamos built to the customer's specifications, and on general electrical contracting. Orders from home and abroad began to flow in as the firm developed a reputation for the quality of its workmanship and its ability to come up with the innovative solutions. By 1889, the Gothic works employed some 25 men, and Scott was turning his attention to making electric motors for ships, an important component of the firm's output in the years ahead. The 1890s was a decade of change for Lawrence Scott. The Gothic works was not large enough to cope with the increasing workload, and it was clear that the company required further capital to maintain its expansion. In 1869, a new company was formed with a share capital of £50,000, which included 50 founders as shares of £1 each, which gave the holders enhanced profit sharing rights compared with the other shareholders. The directors of the new company were Scott, Lawrence, Cecil Wilson and Charles Burlingham. Wilson, an accountant, was Lawrence's brother-in-law, who on Lawrence's death in 1923 would take his place as chairman. Burlingham was Jeremiah Coleman's accountant maintaining the close link with the Colmans. That same year, work began on a new factory, laid out on a site bought from Colmans on the north bank of the river opposite Carrier Works, and named the Gothic Works to perpetuate the links with the original factory. It covered an area of some 7,500 square feet, with work bays arranged around a large yard to facilitate ease of manufacture and was supplied by electricity generated on site. The new works employed about 1,000 men. Timekeeping was strictly enforced, although if a man worked a full 52-hour week without time off, he was paid for 54. When the works opened in 1898, the lease on King Street was relinquished. In 1899, it was decided to dispense with the electrical contracting side, which had grown substantially. The stock and goodwill was bought by Gerald Mann for £6,000, and Lawrence Scott gave an undertaking not to engage in electrical contracting in Norfolk for five years. Lawrence Scott now concentrated on making electric motors and control gear for civilian and military use. New applications were developed for the use of electric power, which required specialist combinations of motors and control gear, such as ammunition hoists for warships. As the company gained expertise in making military equipment, orders came in from Vickers, Maxims and the Admiralty. However, the largest order received during 1899 was for a power station at Lincoln, where Lawrence Scott supplied engines, dynamos, condensers and other equipment. The next few years saw further orders for power stations at Epsom, Kings Lynn and Lowestoft. That year the company filled 500 orders and made a profit of £7,000 thanks to an increase in demand for its electric motors. However, in the face of the increased competition, the firm found it difficult to maintain quality whilst remaining competitive on price. In 1902, Lawrence Scott entered into an agreement with Electromotors, a Manchester-based maker of small electric motors. Scott agreed not to bid for orders for the motors Electromotors specialised in, and in return, Electromotors agreed not to bid for orders for larger motors. The two companies would also sell motors to one another at favourable prices. Scots subsequently discovered they were able to manufacture the smaller motors for less than electromotors could supply them, so the agreement lapsed. By 1905, the economic climate had deteriorated. Much of the workforce was working reduced hours and there had been some redundancies. Despite this, the directors continued to invest in the business, building a new test shop on land bought from Coleman's. As tension increased between Great Britain and Germany, orders from the Admiralty boosted business, and by 1907, the order book was three times what it had been two years earlier. The workforce grew accordingly to meet the demand. In 1907, 430 were employed at the Gothic Works. Within three years, it was up to 550. By then, about 1,000 machines a year were being made, and Lawrence Scott was gaining a national reputation, being described as a firm which makes very high-class electric motors. Output remained at this level for several years, but the motors became larger and more complex. By 1913, the company celebrated its 25th anniversary with a garden party held at Felthorpe Hall, the home of Reginald Lawrence. Gifts of travelling clocks or timepieces were made to members of staff, with the three longest serving being giving gold watches. 
The outbreak of war in August 1914 brought a change of emphasis for Lawrence Scott. Orders for civilian work dried up and work for the Admiralty took precedence, as the company made motors, ammunition hoists, mechanism for turning warship turrets and other marine equipment. There was also a major change in the makeup of the workforce. By October 1914, a quarter of the men had enlisted for the first time. Women were employed at the Gothic Works. In common with other Norwich engineering factories, Lawrence Scott was asked to produce munitions. Construction of two sheds began in late 1915, and new tools were devised to enable semi-skilled workers to make artillery shells. By 1916, around 253-inch and 5-inch shells were being made each day for the war effort. At the end of the war, it was estimated that Lawrence Scott had made about £1 billion worth of shells from homemade tools in two corrugated tin sheds. The piece brought a brief boom, and the company invested in the anticipation of the good times continuing. The Gothic Works was expanded, and a large private house and its grounds on Thorpe Road became the control gear works. Later, a foundry was added. Agencies were established to sell Lawrence Scott Motors in the UK, and links established with the Netherlands to sell motors to shipbuilders there. The boom proved to be short-lived, and was followed by a severe slump. Orders dropped off, prices had to be reduced, and work was taken on at uneconomic prices to keep the business going. In June 1922, a salary cut of 10% was imposed to reduce the wage bill, but despite this, the business was running at only a quarter of its pre-war peak and carrying a substantial overdraft. In July 1923, the company chairman, Reginald Lawrence, died at a London nursing home at the age of 66. He was a great loss. Alongside his role at Lawrence Scott, he had thrown himself wholeheartedly into the life of his adopted country, and in particular the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, where he was a member of the Board of Management and a generous benefactor. During the First World War, he and his wife turned over their home at Thelvig Hall to the Red Cross for use as a hospital. By the time it was returned to their full use in January 1919, its 23 beds had accommodated many military casualties. His position on the board of directors was taken by his nephew, Claude Lawrence, a stockbroker. As the economy began to improve, orders for marine equipment helped Lawrence Scott recover, and by 1924 the firm was breaking even. The Scott Winch, developed in 1922, was a bestseller, with 30 being sold in the first year. By 1925, over 100 were sold, many to Belfast, shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe, but others to Japan, the Netherlands and France. It was reliable, long-lasting and required minimal maintenance. It was also relatively silent, a useful attribute when fitted to the passenger cargo liners then being built. By 1932, about 200 were being sold annually. Much business was done with Belfast shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe in 1920. They took over 60% of Lawrence Scott output. However, not everything was going well. The electrical engineering side was not so quick to recover and struggled throughout the 1920s. In 1928, Lawrence Scott took over Manchester-based electromotors, paying for it with £50,000 worth of Lawrence Scott shares and renaming the business Lawrence Scott and Electromotors, LSE. Electromotors had been making losses for some years. Its factory was antiquated, but its range of small electric motors was a useful addition to the LSE catalogue, and it had experience of making induction motors. This proved useful, as LSE moved from making motors powered by direct current to those powered by alternating current. AC motors and generators were simpler, more reliable, and less costly to manufacture. They had also been safer, as they did not rely on coils, making intermittent contact with the brushes, as DC motors did, which generated heat and produced the possibility of sparking, a major problem if the working environment contained flammable vapours. Just as the company was emerging from the post-war slump, the worldwide economic depression of the late 1930s hit it hard. A reduction in shipbuilding orders, and in particular the suspension of work on the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth in December 1931, which would have used Lawrence Scott motors, winches and control gear, was a huge setback, and yet again salary cuts were imposed. Still driven by ever-inventive William Scott, the company investigated new products. One was the country's first vehicle control traffic lights, activated by cars passing over rubber pads set in the road. Designed by Scott, the first set were installed in the 1930s at the junction of Unthank Road and Coleman Road.
in Norwich, and later used throughout the UK. LSE also developed plotting tables for the Admiralty, used for plotting the positions of enemy ships and aircraft, and motors for diesel, electric, railway locomotives. By 1935, a trading loss of £35,000 suffered during the previous year had been turned into a profit of £15,000, although the company was carrying a £73,000 bank loan. The next few years saw a steady improvement as turnover increased, greatly helped by government orders as the country rearmed. For the financial year 1936, for the first time since 1929, a dividend was paid to the shareholders and capital was invested in extending the Norwich and Manchester factories. The following year saw a 50% increase in production. The number of employees rose to 3,000 and the divided payable to the shareholders was doubled. A source of great pride and something the company made much more of in its advertising was the use of LSE equipment to the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth when work restarted in 1934. In September 1938, the death of William Scott at his home on Yarmouth Road, aged 76, brought an era to a close. He had been in poor health for about a year, and a few weeks before had suffered the death of his youngest son, Thomas. As his obituary in the Eastern Daily Press commented, William had been one of the pioneers of the electrical industry, starting before there were any electrical industry, as we understand it now, the building up in his lifetime a great firm, sending its products to all parts of the world. By the time war arrived in 1939, Profits had risen to £123,000. The firm was effectively on a war footing before 1939, producing submarine motors, sound locators and searchlights for air defences, and plotting tables and ammunition hoists for the Royal Navy. Much of the naval equipment had to function in a harsh environment, so it had to be much more robust than the motors made for civilian use. Women were recruited as men joined the armed forces. After 1945, there were no post-war slump for LSE, but the beginning of a period of sustained success which lasted for 30 years. As of the 31st of December 1945, LSE had total net assets of over £750,000. In 1946, the company issued £250,000 shares to buy new plant and materials and to finance the changeover from war production to peacetime manufacturing. The well-established marine side continued to flourish, with orders being received from across the world, whilst at home LSE winches were installed on most British-built trawlers. In a return to its origins, the company began supplying motors to power stations. Within the UK alone, over 30 coal, oil and nuclear power stations were supplied, including Windscale and Sizewell B. There were diversification into new fields, such as the factory at Kingsbury, near Wolverhampton, which designed, manufactured and installed printing equipment. In 1959, a factory was built at Blindtire in Scotland to make small electric motors for ventilation fans. Additional production space was found in Norwich. A new site was leased at Sellhouse Road for machining, case making and pattern making. A new heavy machinery bay was built at the Gothic Works to provide space for large motors in 1959 and in the 1960s. Thorpe Road Works was extended. In 1961, to secure the skilled engineers it needed, the company established an apprentice training school, retaining most of those who finished their apprenticeships. By 1973, of around 500 school leavers in the Norwich area, 67 joined LSE as apprentices. LSE celebrated its 75th anniversary in 1958, no mean feat as it was one of the few original firms in the electrical engineering industry still surviving in the UK. Not only surviving, but prospering. In their annual report for 1959, the directors could report on orders of a long-term nature for ships winches, traction generators and motors for British railways. By 1977, LSE had a turnover of £28.61 million, up from £25.25 million the previous year, with pre-tax profits of £2.75 million, which the chairman, Paul Tapscott, described as the best year's trading in our history. The company's factories were working at almost full capacity, and a £3 million expansion programme was on schedule. That was as good as it got. A downturn in orders for large electric motors brought reduced profits by 1978. By the end of the following year, turnover was down to just under £16 million, and the company was facing losses of £1.4 million in the first six months of the year. On the morning of the 19th of May 1980, the directors of LSE discovered they were likely to be taken over. 
a firm of stockbroking because acting on behalf of Doncaster-based mining supplies had bought 16.4% of the company's shares. Arthur Snipe, the chairman of mining supplies, announced he intended to buy a substantial stake in LSE, with whom his company did a lot of businesses, to prevent a takeover by anybody else. Mining supplies had been started by Snipe in 1960 to manufacture mining equipment designed by him and made at their three factories near Doncaster. Within four months, the takeover was completed and the new owners announced a major reconstructing to bring the company back into profit. In May 1981, the Manchester factory was closed with a loss of 650 jobs and 90 employees dismissed at Norwich with only two hours notice. A few months later, it was announced that in the future, the company would concentrate on the profitable areas, such as defence equipment and other departments were at risk. In August, what the new owners described as a stringent rationalisation plan was announced, which would involve large-scale redundancies, the introduction of new machine tools and computer-aided management systems. The apprentice training scheme, which was costing the company £600,000 a year, was to be reviewed. The next few years were difficult, both for the company, as its new management fought to return it to profitability, and for the workforce, which was steadily depleted. In 1983, questions were raised about the future of the Thorpe Road Works, after much of the work was moved to the Gothic Works, and more redundancies were announced. It was closed two years later and demolished, to be replaced by the Thorpe Park housing development. By then, the workforce was down to about 1,300, half of what it had been a few years earlier. It was evident that mining supplies was losing interest in LSE, and in June 1986 it was sold to FKI Electrical, in a deal reportedly worth £6.2 million. Mining supplies had decided that LSE was no longer an essential part of its business, and its disposal would permit them to reduce their debts. Mining supplies retained the Salhouse Road plant. FKI Electrical was a group of companies which was expanded rapidly by taking over other businesses and had bought the East Durham clockmakers, Metamec, the year before. Yet again, a change of ownership brought more job losses, Within a few weeks, notice were put up at the Gothic Works, giving staff a few days to apply for voluntary redundancy. Over 300 jobs went, reducing the workforce to about 700. However, the next few years saw substantial investment. In April 1994, FKI announced that the company would spend over £4 million on new equipment at the Gothic Works. Despite a shortage of orders from the defence, power generation and petrochemical industries, the business was strong and profitable. Indeed, LSE had been expanding paying £1.8 million to buy Belgeford pumps. So this came as a shock when in January 2004, LSE announced that due to a shortfall in orders, the manufacture of high voltage electric motors would be moved from Norwich and the Gothic Works closed and sold with a loss of 250 jobs. It became apparent that after three years of declining profits, FKI was in a desperate financial position with debts of over £500 million in an attempt to retrieve the situation it was selling four of the businesses within the group, closing eight others, selling property and getting rid of over 700 staff. Help came from an unlikely source when a group of three American businessmen, George, Claire, John Lumsden and Dick Mittyer, stepped in and after protracted negotiations bought the business for £4.1 million. The deal did not include the Gothic Works, which they leased from FKI for three years. Claire and his colleagues in Fisher's a bright future for LSE, developing a range of high-efficiency electric motors to be sold in the US. They made no promises about retaining all the 225 jobs, and indicated that they were considering outsourcing manufacturing. The sense of optimism and short-lived as within three years, LSE was again in crisis. Despite a full order book, it was suffering from cash flow problems, and in May 2007 went into administration. The administrators made 79 redundancies, but announced they were hoping to sell the business as a growing concern. This time, there were no long drawn out negotiations, as LSE was snapped up by the ATB Group, a division of Austrian company ATB Austria and Schimblichmik. Manufacturers of electric motors, the new business renamed ATB Lawrence Scott, made additional investment at the Gothenic Works installing a new motor test centre at a cost of £2.5 million, and, as a sign of confidence in the future, took on three apprentices, the first taken on in five years. 
In 2009, ATB resolved the uncertainty over the future of the Gothic works by buying the freehold. ATB Lawrence Scott is now owned by the Wolong Holding Group after ATB became insolvent in October 2011. It appears to have a bright future ahead after years of uncertainty and changes of ownership. ATB Lawrence Scott is still making electric motors in Norwich, over 125 years after Scott and Paris first came to Norwich to help Jeremiah Coleman. It is now the only major manufacturer of large, bespoke electric motors in the UK. The company provides a complete service from the initial design to the fabrication of the finished motor. Each of the 170 or so high voltage induction and synchronous motors made each year is built to the customer's requirements and thoroughly tested at the Gothic works before being dispatched. This is essential as many have to perform reliably in harsh conditions such as the offshore oil and gas industries. Over 80% are exported. ATB Lawrence Scott has developed motors using a low starting current, particularly useful when space is at a premium and where the heavy competing demands on power generation such as oil rigs. The company is also committed to the future, taking the view that the best way to secure the supply of skilled workers is to train its own. ATB Lawrence Scott currently has over 20 apprentices in its 200 strong workforce. Despite its sometimes troubled history, ATB Lawrence Scott is a bastion of engineering expertise and a symbol of the city's industrial heritage. Thank you.